Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Good to see the crowd here today. <clears throat> I'm Eric Loudermilk, interim pastor here at Oasis at Conway Gardens, and we're really, really glad to have you here today. If you're visiting with us today, either in person or online, we'd invite you to go to our website, oasisconwaygardens.org, click on I'm New and register your visit with us, or you can raise your hand. And one of the ushers would bring you a visitor's card. We'd like to get a hold of you and welcome you to us. We have one announcement today. Throughout the summer, the Curry Ford West Church Group is sponsoring Sweet Second Sundays, in which, which each of the second Sundays of June, July, and August will be visiting an ice cream shop and having ice cream, loving on that business by bringing our business to them. And of course, you can eat at the restaurants around there. The first one will be June 12th, June 12th from 5 to 8 p.m. And we'll be meeting at the Twisty Tree on Curry Ford in Conway Gardens. We have Adam Jinks and his friend Eric today leading worship. Let's stand as we worship the Lord. Good morning, church. Happy to be with you here to worship. Feel free to sing with me. Who am I? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me, yes He died for me. Sets free, always free and I'm a child of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child. Yes, I am. Sing, I am chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am. are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, always oh, free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I Father, we thank you today for your deep, deep grace. We thank you for loving us, Lord, when we don't despise, when we don't deserve it. And we are who you say we are, despite the enemy telling us otherwise. True, we don't deserve your grace, but we are your children because of the work on the cross. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I want to thank um, Joe Ball for preaching for me last Sunday. 
Uh, and I hear Pastor Ryan did a, an announcement that Joe preached and Pastor Ryan did an announcement. Is that how it went? Um, no, I, I've been fighting a sinus infection and uh, as it's one of those once in a decade ones and I had a very, very long work day the previous Saturday. I had to drive to West Palm and, and uh, teach, team teach with a colleague and then drive back and I was just done. And um, spent quite a bit of time sleeping the next couple of days. So I appreciate Joe covering for me and Ryan for his announcement. We're continuing our series on the Gospel of Mark. And uh, today we're in Mark 4, 35 through 41. Mark 4, 35 through 41. Um, while you're turning there, I want to give a little bit of a pastoral search committee update. Um, you know, these things ebb and flow, and sometimes committees think they have someone and sometimes they don't. The committee still continues to meet. Um, I remember sitting uh, at a church in West Palm in which they would give updates to the pastoral search committee, and they would uh, say, we've continued meeting, we're continuing talking to candidates. And I thought, why don't you ever tell us anything new? Well, that's really the work of it. We've, we've, we've met with about 60 candidates. We think we've figured out, though, why we haven't hired anyone. Would you two guys stand up just a minute and turn around? We have this unwritten policy that anyone who serves here has to have a beard. And we can't find a pastor who has a beard as good as these guys. Thanks, guys. But we're still continuing to work, and today during prayer time, we will pray for the committee. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Mark 4. Verses 35 through 41. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him and with them in the boat just as he was. And the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him, and they said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were just filled with great fear, and they said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of sharing your word. Lord, again, I do not deserve to stand here, and it's only on the foundation of amazing grace that I do. I pray, God, today that your words, your truth would reign true, Lord, and that we would be encouraged by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I took my wife to the movies yesterday. First date we'd had in a long time. I've been kind of busy. And uh, <clears throat> there were previews, and there's a new movie coming out called Lightyear by Pixar Studios. It's the story of Buzz Lightyear's backstory before the Toy Story series, Toy Story 1, 2, 3, and 4. And it reminded me of one of my favorite scenes in the series. It comes from the 1999 version, Toy Story 2. You see, uh, for, for how many's not seen Toy Story 2? Kathy, Kathy, so everyone else. Joe, you've seen Toy Story 2? Why don't you raise your hand? Oh, okay. Joe, you were real anxious to preach last weekend. I can't get you to raise your hand today. Okay, so those who haven't seen Toy Story 2... It's a drama uh, between animated toys. And there is uh, one space astronaut figure called Buzz Lightyear who thinks he's here to save the world. And he's fighting the evil arch enemy, Zerg, who travels the universe to kill him. And there's a scene in, on the top of an elevator, not in the elevator, but on top of the elevator as they're going down, the elevator's going down, and they're fighting, you know, all these cables in danger. And it looks like Buzz has lost. And we hear uh, Zerg say, surrender, Buzz Lightyear. 
I have won. Buzz Lightyear says, I will never give in. You killed my father. And Zerg says, no, Buzz, I am your father. And Buzz responds, no, as the elevator shaft goes downward. And there is that scene. Now, some of you are chuckling a little bit. You seem to know something, maybe others don't. What are, what are we missing here? Star Wars. Thank you, Carol. Great. Because the scene is recalling an iconic scene from the 1977 blockbuster film, Star Wars. In the near final scene, we see Darth Vader fighting the young Luke Skywalker. His hand is cut off. And as they're finishing the fight, it looks like Luke will die. They work their way out on a catwalk, extending over a deep, cavernous air shaft. Looks like Luke's going to lose and be killed. To which we hear Darth Vader say, join me, and I will complete your training. With our combined strength, we can end this destructive conflict and bring order to the galaxy. Luke says, I'll never join you. Vader says, if you only knew the power of the dark side, Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. Luke says, he told me enough. It was you who killed my father. And Vader replies, no, I am your father. Shocked, Luke looks at Vader in utter disbelief and says, no, no, it's not possible. That's not true. Search your feelings, says Vader. You know it to be true. And Luke yells, no, no. Eventually, overcome with grief, Luke chooses to let go and fall down the shaft. And the makers of Toy Story 2 are bringing a little humor to the older viewers of the audience by echoing back to Star Wars. One of the way filmmakers make audiences interested is by making allusions to a previous story, such as these makers of Toy Story 2 when alluding to this famous scene in Star Wars. This is nothing new. It's been around as long as storytelling has been around. Literary scholars call this intertextuality. Now, that's a $5 word, but sometimes it's good to remember something if you get a $5 word. So number one on your handout is intertextuality. It's just like it sounds, intertextuality. I'm not going to be spell-checking this. Intertextuality is defined as when one story gets meaning, meaning, or emotional affect by referring to another story. Intertextuality is defined as when one story gets meaning or emotional affect by referring to another story. So let's, let's do another Let's look at the next slide. All right. Objects in mirror are closer than they appear. Who knows where I'm going with this? Ron. Jurassic Park. Yeah, correct. A famous scene in Jurassic Park, next slide, where the Tyrannosaurus Rex is chasing the guys in the Jeep, and the mirror humorously tells you, hey, this rascal's bigger and closer than he appears. But that's not the only time that shows up. Where else does that show up? Also in Toy Story 2, in the tour guide Barbie scene, the toy T-Rex falls out of the Jeep and is trying to catch up to hang out with his friends. And the driver of the Jeep looks in the mirror and sees this image. Objects in the mirror appear close, are closer than they appear. And the audience roars into laughter. Once again, an intertextual illusion to a previous story. Point two. So how do they do this? How do they do this? Storytellers allude to previous stories by carefully selecting details, details on your handout, to include in their story that are common to both stories. I have uh, another little illustration I share in class I won't get into now. But it's not that authors when we go to the biblical text, are making this up. I have known about this technique for about 20 years, and I have now seen situations in life where one thing will happen in my life just like it happened years earlier, and I could imagine myself retelling the story and picking certain details to include. I um, 
went to a gag gift, a Christmas party, a white elephant gift, and I bought. I had just lost uh, a car charger, a little plug-in charger, and I was late to the party, and uh, I needed one in my car, and I thought, ironically, I'll just give one away. Actually, maybe I'd bought it for myself. And, um, yeah, this was like a week or two earlier I'd had one. Anyhow, I went to this party, and I, and I gave, uh, wrapped the gift, gave it out, and everyone trades and steals gifts, and I ended up being the last person. Who wants to guess what gift I ended up with? The car charger. So all I had to do was tell those stories, and I did it rather rushed, in a rushed format, but you pick and choose which pieces of the story to include so that people put two and two together. The point is, people need not lie to make this up, although Toy Story and I hope Star Wars are fiction. But as I said, storytellers have been doing this for a long time. Turn in your Bibles to Judges 19, verse 12. Judges, it's in the Old Testament, it's before Samuel. I'm actually there turning there with you. Judges 19, verses 12 through 24. Now listen to these details as I read it to you. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, not... Oh, I'm in Joshua. Well, that would make... That would make... Tell you, the cold medicine is still in me. I had a moment of panic that I had written down the wrong notes. So you have a story of uh, two men traveling, and um, one is a Levite, and the Levite has a concubine, and they're on this long trip, and they stay in a man's house. Uh, They're actually looking for a place to stay, and they don't want to stay with non-Jewish people at that time because they consider them dangerous and immoral. So we're going to pick it up at verse 12. And his master said to him, We will not turn aside into the city of foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel, but we will pass on to Gibeah. And he said to his young man, to his servant, Come, let us draw near to these places and spend the night at Gibeah or at Ramah. So they passed and went on their way, and the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin, which is a tribe of Israel, so they get close to their people. And they turned aside there, and they went in to spend the night at Gibeah, And they went in and sat down in the open square of the city. Now, what you don't know is in the open square, that's the gates of the city. That's where they would hear court cases. That's where you'd meet strangers and so forth. For no them took them into their home that night. And behold, an old man was coming in from the field that evening. The man was from the hill country of Ephraim, another Israeli place. And he was sojourning in Gibeah. The men of the place were Benjamites, and he lifted up his eyes and saw the travelers in the open square of the city. And the old man said, Where are you going? And where do you come from? And he said, We are passing from Bethlehem to Judah to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, from which I come. I went to Bethlehem of Judah, and I'm going to the house of the Lord. But no one has taken me into his house. We have uh, straw and feed for our donkeys and so forth, and he lets him in. Now, I'm going to skip down to um, verse 22. As they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, worthless fellows, surrounded their house, beating on the door. And they said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him. And they do mean sex there. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said, No, my brothers, don't act so wickedly since the man has come into my house. Do not do this vile thing. Look, here's my virgin daughter and his concubine, which is in between a wife. It's like a wife for fun. Um, Behold, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now violate them, and do what seems good to you. But against this man, don't do this outrageous thing. That doesn't sound too fun, does it? Now, does that story remind you of anything? Does it remind anyone of any story? Maybe our older saints might catch this. Anyone? 
Anyone? Adam? Eric? This reminds us, actually, of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, if there's any city in the Bible, or twin cities, set of cities, that's supposed to be the most immoral in all of Scripture, it's Sodom and Gomorrah. And so, God sends two angels. This is in Genesis 19. We have the text up for that, but we won't turn to it. And the angels come in the city, and they stop at the gate, and they're invited into the house by Lot. And then the men of the city pound on the door. You have a repeating of that story in the judge's story, the pounding on the door. And they say, send out the men that you have so that you may know them as well. And Lot says, don't do this terrible, terrible thing. Instead, here are my two virgin daughters. Take with them and do what you want with them. Of course, the angels know better and they reach in and shut the door. And so in that story, the point is things are so bad in Sodom and Gomorrah that Lot, even though he's a righteous man, is warped in his thinking. But the question then, when we go back to the story in Judges, what do you think the author of Judges is trying to say by including the details in his story so you'll think of the Sodom and Gomorrah story? Does anyone have an idea what the author of Judges is trying to say? See, the key verse in Judges is Judges 17, 6, which reads, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. In the south we'd say everyone did what they Jim Jack pleased. Things are a mess in the book of Judges, and they just get worse and worse and worse. And what the author of Judges is screaming at you, but he's using this literary storytelling tool of intertextuality, he's saying... Things in Israel now are just as bad as they were in Sodom and Gomorrah. So he's using one story to imply and say something very clearly. Now, we get this in the movies, but we don't analyze and stop to think about it. So when we go to Scripture, we just sort of turn our brain off. Oh, I've read my verse for today, God. I've read my chapter check mark. But part of my job as your pastor is to teach you how to read scripture and then also help you find the truths in scripture so the first half of this message is more teaching and teaching you how to find it so what's this have to do with our passage today well mark actually tells us he used this uses this technique let's go to mark 1 6 mark 1 6 so as with other (coughs) some of the other gospels it store it starts with John the Baptist coming, and we covered this um, in installment one. And um, in six, John gives us this un- Mark gives us this unusual detail about how John is clothed. Verse six. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locust and wild honey. I think we have this on the screen. We don't know why my mic pops when I move. I guess I should not move. <clears throat> now, one of the things I haven't told you is for its time period, stories in the Bible, especially Old Testament, but even the Gospels and Acts, don't include details that aren't necessary. They do not include details that aren't necessary. All the details are there for a reason. And um, we're supposed to pay attention to those. Scholars, when looking at this passage, these unusual details, why do we need to be told what John the Baptist wore? Well, scholars are virtually unanimous in that Mark is using this intertextuality technique pointing to 2 Kings 1.8, which we have on the slide for you. We have on the slide for you, I think. Do I have this one? Yes, he, meaning Elijah, wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather around his waist, and he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. We won't go into that whole story. So the prophet Micah in the Old Testament had prophesied that before the day of the Lord, in other words, when Jesus comes, Elijah would come back to announce his way. And so Mark 
is telling you by this technique of referring one story to another who John the Baptist is. You might say, well, that's a stretch. Well, look at Matthew eleven fourteen. 14. Jesus actually tells this. If you are willing to accept it, John the Baptist is Elijah to come. So Matthew records it explicitly. Mark records it implicitly. But in the ancient storytelling world, neither way is better than the other. We just read our Bibles thinking everything should just be plain. But when we go to the movies, we engage in this type of viewing or reading. We should do the same thing in Scripture. Are you with me so far? <clears throat> All right. So what is Mark doing when we get to our passage in Mark 4.35? So we had this story of a storm, and the people in the boat are afraid. They wake Jesus. He's uh, sleeping. Lord, what are you doing? Why are you sleeping? Don't you care that we're perishing? Jesus gets up, quiets the storm, and then the disciples who are in the boat are really, really afraid. Does anyone catch what Mark might be alluding to here? Anyone catch that? Some of our older folks who've maybe read a lot of the scriptures. Okay, the answer, and Jack can pass out, and his team can pass out the second handout, is Jonah. So let me catch you up to that story. I promise we'll be out by 3 p.m. today. I just promise. Jonah is commissioned by God to go prophesy to an enemy city to repent. And Jonah doesn't want to do it. Because Jonah knows God is merciful and forgiving, and that when Jonah goes and tells them, hey, God's going to destroy this place, if the people of Nineveh repent, then God's going to forgive them, and he won't destroy the place. And Jonah's more worried about his reputation than he is for the people of Nineveh. Well, to get away from this, Jonah charters a boat to sail away. And on the boat, a storm comes up. And as you see on your screen, I have highlighted the similarities between the two storms because it just it takes too much time to go through slowly. So we not only have the scene replicated, we have the structure replicated, even the content of the questions. So in yellow, they're on a boat. In green, a storm comes up. In blue, the storm is so bad, those on the boat, their life is in those on the boat, their life is in danger. In purple, the main character is asleep in the boat. So we have Jesus asleep on a pillow. Now, they could have just said uh, they woke Jesus, but you have this added detail. He's sleeping as if nothing's the matter. Well, that's similar to Jonah, and Mark is using that detail. He could have skipped it. He's including it for you to help you think back to Jonah. Then the question in yellow. The content of the question, don't you care that we're perishing? Um, and then in the Jonah story, we have the long dialogue of trying to figure out who's in trouble and him and Jonah telling the, the sailors, I serve the Lord and so forth, chuck me over the side of the boat and the storm will go away. Oh, we don't want to do that. That'd be terrible. You've got to do it. So they ask God to forgive them, and then they chuck Jonah over the side of the boat. And then the second section in blue, the winds ceased, and there was a great calm. And then the last parallel in the second section of purple is in both stories, the occupants of the boat are feared, filled with great fear. So you see the comparisons? You see how Mark has crafted this story so that... His readers, whom he expects will know the Hebrew Scriptures, will compare the two. So that leads us to the end of the passage, where it says in bold on your sheet, in verse 41, the disciples say, Who then is this, that even the wind and the seas obey him? Now, the way the Gospels are written is to invite your interaction. Mark and John and other gospel writers are writing these stories in such a way to convince you to believe.
See, they're written in the first and second centuries, so mostly first, and they're trying to convince their readers that Jesus really is who he says he is. So it's inviting a response. It's not just telling you a story. It's inviting you to answer the response. Who then is this that even the wind and sea can obey him? Well, we can answer that. The answer is in the story that Mark is alluding to. Who actually calms the storm in the Jonah story? Who does the calming? It's underlined about seven times in your Jonah passage. The Lord. See, if if we throw Jonah overboard, the Lord will calm the storm. Now, when we did our first week, I think it was in Mark, I reminded you of an Old Testament technique. And that is, when you see the word Lord in the first half of your Bible, especially in small caps or all caps, it means God. There are two words in ancient Hebrew that refer to God. One is called Elohim, which is kind of like our general word for God. It means that being who's divine. It's more just defining the quality of being God. The other is the word behind Lord, and that is Yahweh. And it is the specific name of God, of the only God, of our God, of the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh. The Jews would not say it when they read the scriptures. They got used to saying Lord in Hebrew because that name was too holy to say. And so your Bible translators today in the Old Testament reproduce that by not writing Yahweh. They write Lord in small or all caps. So, if Mark wants you to think of Jonah and the disciples ask, Who is this? Who is Jesus that even the wind and the seas obey him? What is the answer that Mark wants you to get? It's the Lord. So number three on your handout, it is the Lord. Therefore, number four on your handout, what is Mark saying to us? Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is God. Number four, Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is God. Now, while you're filling that in, here's another advertisement that you're probably tired of hearing me say. This is why you read your Bibles. We don't read our Bibles so that whenever you read them, you know, the most holy time is to read it in the morning. But uh, I'm happy if you read it any and more and more. Morning, noon, night, listening in the car. The goal is that you'll learn, and as you learn, God will bless your life. It's not that I'm going to turn on my Bible writing to work today and the Holy Spirit better bless me today. That's not the right approach. The right approach is I'm going to listen and learn, and I don't know what I'll learn. One of the things you learn is by getting those Old Testament stories deep in your gut, you'll start to catch some of these things in the New Testament when the writer's referring to the Old. Now, this position... That Mark is referring to Jonah is pretty common. Scholars agree on that. Scholars, even conservative ones, are a little debated as to whether or not Mark is trying to say to us, look, Jesus is God. One of the things they say is, wait a minute, there's Old Testament prophets who did miracles on behalf of God, but that doesn't mean they were God. Well, I think they're wrong. In fact, I would just dare say I'm pretty certain they're wrong. And I want to affirm you of this. So let's ask, number five, how can we be sure? How can we be sure that this is what Mark is saying, that Mark is using this calming of the sea story to scream at us implicitly that Jesus is God? Bullet point number one. Flip over back to Mark 1. Quick review of week one in the Mark series. Verse 3 Mark is quoting Isaiah, and he, he <clears throat> well, let me back up to two. Uh, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, in other words, just like it says, it's happened from Isaiah the prophet, look, I send my messenger before your face, that's John the Baptist, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, and here's what John is to say, prepare the way of the Lord. 
And in Isaiah, that Lord is all small caps. We went over this in week one. Prepare the way for Yahweh. So, in that first bullet point, verses 3, 4, 7, and 8, uh, Mark tells us that John the Baptist was preparing the way for the Lord, God himself. And then in verses 10 through 11, we won't read them, Mark tells us that that person is Jesus. We went over this the very first week, that Mark is not backing off one iota, that Jesus is divine. Now, he and the Father are distinct, unless some people believe in uh, oh, something called a oneness doctrine. We won't get into that, whether God is in different modes. But the point is Jesus and the Father are both God. We hear in the Gospel of John, I and my Father are one. They're different, but they're both God himself. Point two, or bullet two, in Mark one twenty four. The demons say, you are the Holy One of God. You are the Holy One of God. One of the ironies in Mark is that the demons in the text know who Jesus is before the human characters. Even the demons know that he is God. Now, in your Bibles, you probably will notice that if you were to look in Mark 1.24, you are the Holy One of God. Holy and one are capitalized. Bible translators capitalize words that refer to God. Even your Bible translators know that the demons are calling Jesus divine. Bullet point three. Let's go to Mark 2. <clears throat> well, I'll just re remind you the story. It's Mark 2, 7 through 12. So... There's a crowd in Capernaum around a house. And there's a man who's paralyzed. And his friends can't get him to Jesus so that Jesus can touch him and heal him. So what do they do? They dig a hole through the roof and they lower the man down. And Jesus switches the order up. He knows what's going to happen. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. So the scribes, the religious law experts of the day, say to themselves rhetorically, wait, who can forgive sins except God alone? Jesus' enemies are saying the only person who can forgive sins is God alone. So what does Jesus deal, do? He says, really? Well, just so that you know, I do have that authority. And he says to the man, rise up and walk. So bullet point three here, Jesus heals to prove that he has that authority to forgive sins. Jesus is God. So how do we know that that's what Mark is doing in Jonah? Well, because it completely fits all the context of the first four chapters of Mark. That's all Mark is doing in the first quarter of his gospel. Is he screaming at you? explicitly and implicitly, that Jesus is God. So that last bullet, Mark's main message for chapters 1-4, Jesus is God. As I began this series and in previous messages, I have mentioned that in a 2018 debate between Dr. Bart Ehrman, University of North Carolina, and Dr. Mike Lacona, Dr. Ehrman made a comment along the lines of, the synoptics, which means the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, don't even mention it. Mention what? That Jesus is God. I re-listened to that message, that debate a few weeks ago, actually a couple months ago now. I really care deeply about this issue. It just hurts me to know that you have to face this kind of attack on your faith. Some of you are interested in these things and you look for things on YouTube some of you just happen to run into it, or just your coworker says, hey, there's no God. I was renting a car at the airport a few weeks ago and got into a quick conversation with the rental clerk, and he goes, yeah, I'm an atheist. I don't believe there's a God. It sort of skews an accurate read of the Gospels. We did a little research, and 70% of Americans today 
believe God exists. But it's certain voices in the mainstream media and scholars like Dr. Ehrman that believe otherwise. And let me just say, I don't hate Dr. Ehrman. Uh, Dr. Lycona has become good friends with Ehrman, and he's the person to best communicate to Dr. Ehrman and try to lead him to Christ and back to his faith. Modern research shows us that doubt is a part of faith. For those of you who sometimes doubt your faith and you feel that you're a second-rate follower of Jesus because you have some doubt, I think you're a little off there. Research now tells us that doubt is a part of faith. In fact, we find out later, we'll preach about this later in Mark chapter 9, that the father of the boy that Jesus heals, the father says, Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. And so today what I'm trying to do, in addition to teaching you more about how to read story, is to help you who have that concern. Those of you who say, Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. Maybe you've heard in my sermons or elsewhere that Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't say Jesus is God, but John does. That's a common position of more liberal scholars. Mark is screaming to you. He is screaming to you that Jesus is God. In fact, there are those who, whether they see someone rise from the dead or appreciate good literature in the Gospels, will never believe. I close with the story in Luke 16 in which the rich man dies and goes to hell and another man, a Lazarus, is in heaven and the rich man calls out to Father Abraham, please have Lazarus dip his finger in the cool water and put it on my tongue because I'm perishing in these flames. And then Abraham reminds him of the way he lived on earth and and he's getting his punishment now. And then the man says, I beg you to send messengers to my brothers at my father's house. Tell them that this is real. Tell them that God really is real. And in Luke 16, 29, Jesus tells of Abraham, supposedly replying, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear. And he said, no, my father, but if someone goes to them from the dead, even from the dead, they'll repent. And he says, no, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. We see miracles all around us. Sometimes we need to pull away from the hustle and bustle to just clear ourselves of the voices of TV and our friend Dr. Ehrman who challenges it. When I go hiking and I see the order and the beauty of creation, And we hear from scientists that if one little thing were off on our planet, none of us would be here. We're reminded that life is full of miracles and the divine does exist. And his name is Jesus. And he loves you dearly. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows.
Ketzel had surgery this week and she's recovering and doing well at home. We pray that she continues to do well. Kathy Gillen's neighbor, Kennedy, just passed away. And we, Kathy was close to him. We'll lift her up. We also want to pray for Kennedy's family as they grieve its loss. Bud Self is home today finding an infection. We want to lift him up. We also want to pray for the pastoral search committee. And then lastly, there's a gentleman in our neighborhood just two blocks south of us. His name is Jason, who lost his significant other rather violently and suddenly this week. Uh, so I don't have Jason's last name, but we want to lift him up. Uh, Pat and I got to meet him this week after he lost his friend, uh, Andrew. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you today. And we ask that you would apply your word to our hearts, that you would empower us to apply your word to our hearts. May we walk ever closer every day to you, Jesus, surrendering to your divinity and to your lordship, knowing that while we surrender, we will fail, but it is your grace that sees us through bought with your blood on the cross as you died for us as a sacrifice for our failures. Lord, we lift up friends and family today. We pray for Darlene that you would continue to heal her. We pray, Lord, for Kathy's neighbor's family, Kennedy, that you would work through this passing to draw them closer and to draw them to you. We lift up Bud, who's fighting this infection. We pray for healing in his body. We thank you, Lord, that Jackie is doing well. We lift up our neighbor who grieves the loss of his friend, Jason. We pray for Andrew today, that you would comfort him and draw you to you. And Lord, lastly, we lift up our pastoral search committee, that you would guide us, Lord. Lord, this is important, important work. And sometimes... We can get discouraged. But you have demonstrated yourself on this property the last few years. And so we believe you have a future for our church. And we pray that you would bring the man who will lead this church in the next few years, God. We thank you, Lord, for these things. Lord, we lift up our local government. And we pray for the city of Orlando and its leadership. We lift up our state. Pray for Governor DeSantis and his team and the members of the legislature. We lift up the leadership of this nation, Lord, regardless of party affiliation. We pray, Lord, that the heart of the king would be in the hand of the Lord and that you would guide this country and our world back to you. We thank you for these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me as we sing this Holy Spirit?
to be overcome by your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free and my shame is undone, your presence, Lord. Sing Holy Spirit. thank you today again for us having a chance to gather and worship and we just pray you'd make us more like you every day in Jesus name you may be seated ushers will you come forward please thank you for coming today and thank you for your generous support of the church <clears throat> as I've said many times before um, you have really served the church well in the last couple years of raising your giving and uh, we're going to ask today that the Lord would bless this gift. And uh, If you're visiting with us, the giving is the responsibility of regular attenders and members. You're welcome to give, but that's not a condition of you being here. Let's pray. God, thank you for all your gifts to us. Now, God, as we give back to you from our financial resources, we pray, Lord, that you would use it for your kingdom, that we could bring this news to more people. Lord, I pray you'd bless these homes spiritually, Lord, but also financially for their giving. Those that are sacrificially giving, Lord, would you answer them? Would you pour out the storehouse of heaven on them and meet their needs, we pray. In Jesus' name. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, it's your breath. Our hearts. 
hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Would you stand as we close with this? All the earth. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath. day in your house. As we leave today, Lord, may we be reminded that it is your breath in our lungs and that we will continue to pour out your praise day in and day out. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. Have a good week. Hey, if you stuck around long enough for the end of this video, I just want to thank you again for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. If I could, I just want to take one more second of your time today to ask you and encourage you to subscribe to our channel on YouTube and also to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. All three of those accounts are under the name Oasis at Conway Gardens. And if I could, I want to encourage you to like videos, comment on them, and even share them to your own social media accounts. Now this is not a way for the church to become more popular and we don't make any money off of likes, comments, or shares. This is just a way for us in a digital age to be able to share the gospel. We want to get the good news of Jesus Christ and his love for us out to a broken and hurting world and this is one of the best ways that we can do that. So if you could take just a second to go follow our social media accounts, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and maybe the next time you watch one of our videos, hit the like button, comment on it, or share it to your social media accounts if you feel compelled to do so. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for joining us and have a great week.